The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It is episode 346. It is, well, this was supposed to be an all-in preview show. And then, naturally, all hell broke this week. All hell broke loose this week. Uh, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, unfortunately, we have so much to talk about this week. And as always, so many things we can't talk about. Uh, first and yeah. only wrestling podcast, etc. Not not really a week for jocularity, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, Terry Funk passed away this week. Um, that was not unexpected. Um, mm. Bray Wyatt passed away this week. That was unexpected. And uh, Bray Wyatt passed away, or Triple H uh, posted on X about an hour before we were about to record that um, he'd been informed by Mike Rotundo that Bray Wyatt had unexpectedly passed away at age 36. We don't know a lot. We know that um, he's married to Jojo Offerman and he has four kids and he was 36 years old. And uh, that's uh, that's bad times. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the worst. Um, I think there's anybody who's dealt with the loss of a loved one can probably attest to this. Um, there's never a good time to lose somebody. And you can say that about both Terry Funk and uh, Bray Wyatt this week, but um, yeah, it's especially tragic for someone who not only was so young themselves, but also had so many, uh, you know, had several young children as well. Um, yeah, it's just, there's, there's never, there's never a good time for, for death. It, it comes for, for all of us eventually, but yeah, especially with someone so young who seemingly had so much, uh, out in front of them still um so much more life to experience and certainly the lives of his uh his wife and children and the rest of his family just uh just um just awful just an awful feeling and and uh you know i'm I'm sure there are already a lot of tributes pouring in you know a lot of the people that are on top in wwe and in aew for that matter you know knew him well worked with him came up with him in fcw um, and I'm sure it's going to be a, you know, a, just a, just a really, really tough few days for for all of them that uh, that knew him. Yeah. Terry Funk was 79 and. Um, universally beloved. Don't yeah. think anyone has ever said a bad word about uh, Terry Funk. He went into he's in every wrestling hall of fame as he should be. And um I think we were talking off the air about how it's difficult to because there's so much and uh he worked everywhere for many decades. It's <laughs> if you're if you just wanted to to like put together a playlist of Terry Funk's greatest hits to catch up on, it's like, well. His best stuff is probably pre everything being on video in the the territory days. And then he was sporadically in and out of all of the major companies from 1985 until, you know, 1999, 2000. (laughs) Right. So it's hard to know where to start other than obviously watch the first ECW pay-per-view, watch the flair funk stuff from mm-hmm. uh from 89 WCW when they go, go out of uh Flair Steamboat into Flair Funk. Other than that, it's hard to know where to start on Terry Funk's career and where to <laughs> how to kind of get yourself up to speed on. It. Yeah, he's just one of those uh like you said, like you can you can go to the the territories in the 70s he's the nwa champion he's you know worked worked hogan in wwf worked you know worked flair as you said in wcw the ecw you know that company is built to an extent off of his his hard work selling that that you know that company was very much you know flying by the seat of their pants as anyone who works there will tell you 
And, you know, that first pay-per-view was built around him, you know, and uh, in, in many ways. And uh, yeah. And then you, you know, from the, and a guy who could, he was just good at everything. There aren't, there are a lot of guys who are really good at promos or brawling or technical wrestling or what have you. Uh, or, and there's a lot of guys who were great in a certain era. Um, but Terry Funk was good from, you know, the 1970s all the way through to the year 2000 in his own way. He always, you know, he, he knew how to get over <laughs> even when, you know, he's in his fifties swinging trash cans at Norman Smiley or whatever. Um, even when he came back right. for the, the little cameo for the ECW uh, stuff with, with Foley and edge, he's still good there. Like, right. Yeah, yeah. You know, him and dusty cutting promos on each other for turnbuckle championship wrestling or whatever it was where they, you know, rekindled their feud on the Indies for a little bit. It's like, yeah, guy was, guy was great at everything could make you laugh could could be serious could be a threat could be terrifying and you know sometimes could do it all in the space of one segment yeah ray wyatt more complicated a more complicated <laughs> legacy um a guy universally loved behind the scenes a guy i'm not sure anyone has ever had more loyal fans than bray wyatt oh yeah um a guy who create no one's going to argue that this was a guy you can't argue that this guy wasn't creative as hell. Like he was creative as Mm -hmm. hell, whether it fits in a pro wrestling context. I'm not sure. feels like maybe he should have ended up um, writing horror movies or writing comic books of a certain genre or, doing something along those lines, but he, he was from a, he's, you know, second, third generation wrestler and he ends up um, in, in WWE and then trying to apply his creative juices in his mind and all of that to a wrestling character and to varying degrees of success over the course of over a decade. Um, he'd been sidelined with an illness, Fightful reported, it was career and life threatening, but he was on the road to being cleared. And then this just kind of came out of nowhere this week. So a complicated um, creative legacy, but uh, <laughs> a universally loved guy. Yeah. I mean, look, we've we've talked about it over and over again because he's he's been a fixture of WWE television for the most part for uh, for the past decade. Um, it wasn't always, it wasn't always for me. It wasn't always for either of us, I think to say the least, but yeah, no one, no one ever doubted his, his, him throwing all of his gusto behind whatever he was doing and, um, clearly had a creativity that, that not everyone has. And you, you see why, you know, he survived on that, on that show and was a fixture of, of WWE for for as long as he was you know and and even if the material wasn't always great he was obviously you know a pretty captivating television performer all the way through so um yeah just and like you said obviously a universally loved guy and you know think you think you know he started in in fcw obviously his brother uh bo dallas and then you have you know you have like the seths and Big E's and naomi and aj and the bailey and sasha and that crew that came in a little bit later and then came to the main roster and he's already there and brian danielson all these guys that are you know across the different companies that he uh you know came up with and 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 was close with even still um yeah it's just it's just one of those deaths, you know, not dissimilar, I would say, um, than than when when Brody Lee passed, where it's just it's a death that will, I am sure, directly and very terribly affect a lot of a lot, a lot of current current performers in a way that's, you know, a legend as much, you know, as tragic as the death of an all time legend like Terry Funk is having one of your peers, one of your contemporaries, especially someone so universally loved past will, you know, will be something that will stick with a lot of these folks for a long time. I'm sure. 
Hard to transition out of that into talking about dumb pro wrestling shows, but <laughs> here we are. Um, it's what we do here. So WWE has payback coming up next weekend. We can touch on that stuff real quick um, because obviously the bigger stuff this week is um, all in, which has the chance to be, if it isn't already, um, the highest paid attendance for a pro wrestling show ever, which seems notable. But for WWE payback so far, we have Trish Stratus versus Becky Lynch in a cage match in a feud that peaked three months ago. <laughs> we have Shinsuke Nakamura versus Seth Rollins for the uh, fake world title, which I actually like that what they what they have uh, done there and in and, and, uh, briefly setting this up. And uh, that's that uh, Nakamura knows Seth's Achilles heel and it's, he has a bad back. Mm-hmm. This is kind of like the Miro's Miro's neck of sand uh, <laughs> st- storyline but uh, done better with higher production values. And uh, so that match is official, and um, Raquel Rodriguez will challenge Rhea Ripley for one of the women's world titles at uh, at Payback. Coming up next weekend, they had nothing announced, and then uh, they announced um, Becky versus Trish on an episode of Main Event. <laughs> and then from there... They added a couple of matches to it on Raw. It looks like we're getting probably Gunther versus Chad Gable in another Intercontinental title match. And maybe um, Austin Theory and Rey Mysterio for the U.S. title. That could be a pay-per-view match or it could be a TV match uh, at some point here coming up soon. But um, slow build considering they uh, had one match announced uh 12 days out or whatever and now they have three matches announced uh, eight days out or whatever but uh payback uh nothing ever happens on wwe television <laughs> they just kind of move at a glacial pace towards payback any thoughts yeah i mean i don't i don't think anything's been terrible uh but yeah it's not it's not exactly uh lighting lighting the world on fire to say the least i did really like the nakamura interview you know, it's so funny because for all of Vince McMahon's hatred of what pro wrestling is and has always been, like he never got past the idea that to be a pro, to be a, to cut a promo, you have to stand in the ring with a microphone. Yes. And here they are being like, okay, Nakamura, super charismatic guy, always has been, speaks very, you know, very good English for a non native speaker, Correct. but you allow him to cut a promo speaking a little bit in English, also speaking in Japanese and let him weave this tale and you cut in video packages. Like it's fe- it felt like, yeah, this is something, this is what you should do with someone who isn't great at speaking in front of a crowd. You know, they did similar stuff with the Shayna and Ronda build before SummerSlam, which I mean, it was a good promo. It was a terrible match, but, but yeah, maybe, maybe we should be doing more of this. Um, and, and uh, you know, it's not a not a new a new thing to suggest they should highlight people's strengths and and use their their very high production values to uh you know to accentuate something like this but yeah i really liked that um it's the most interesting nakamura has been in five years (laughs) so uh big thumbs up to that and then yeah this pay-per-view is bloodlines taking a vacation and so it feels like WWE has taken a vacation from booking anything that anyone would really care about beyond, you know, I'm sure it'll be a good show in the ring, but uh, nothing, nothing really lighting your world on fire. Sure. The other big news coming out of the company. Edge. <laughs> Edge. Um, last week's SmackDown was a tribute show to Edge. And um, they did. A lot of great videos for him during last week's SmackDown. And then he beat Sheamus in the main event in his hometown. And his WWE contract is either expired after that match or it expires at the end of September, depending on whether you choose to believe 
Edge or not. <laughs> Edge addressed the crowd after SmackDown and said, this is probably my last match in Toronto. I don't see how I get back here to have another match. Um, so then he says that uh, his contract's up at the end of September. And then PW Torch um, reported this week. They never have any scoops, by the way. Say what you will about PW Torch. They've been at this game for a long time. And prior to this week, the last scoop they had was uh, four years ago that John Moxley <laughs> was uh, was leaving WWE. Fair. So it's it's been over four years since PW Torch had a scoop. And they had a scoop this week in that uh, WWE thinks Edge is going to AEW. And that Edge had presented WWE in negotiations with what it would take to sign him. And they had not agreed to those terms. And so that they think he's going to AEW. And then Edge did a comeback video, I guess, um, saying that WWE did not deny his uh, demands and that he has a contract ex- extension sitting in his inbox. He just hasn't decided whether to sign it or not. And uh, Edge, who famously worked the internet, uh, prior to his WWE comeback <laughs> uh, three years ago, three and a half years ago, uh, could very well again be working the internet here. Because uh, really what he said was he didn't really, nothing that he said refuted what PW Torch reported. They Correct. didn't report, they didn't report the WWE didn't offer him a contract extension. <laughs> he says WWE offered him a contract extension. Those things are not mutually exclus- exclusive. Um, they reported that WWE thinks he's going to AEW. And he did not say, I'm not going to AEW. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we'll have to see where the ballad of uh, Adam Copeland uh, takes us here. But um, very few people get to go out. Um, if If he's done with WWE, and I wouldn't be surprised either way. I I think there's a 100% chance he wrestles again. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be shocked which company it would be in, and I wouldn't be surprised either way uh, if he ended up back in WWE or if he went to AEW. But um, very few people get the kind of send-off that WWE gave him on SmackDown last week. And uh, he went out having a very nice television match and to cap a very uh, forgettable return. <laughs> Yeah. Any thoughts? Any thoughts on this? Yeah. Yeah. Um. I I agree pretty much with what everything that you said. Um. It was uh. It was a very very nice presentation. They did a great great video package. You know, encapsulating everything from him appearing on some like Canadian public access channel, asking Bret Hart. That's that's kind of a famous story now. I think that he asked Bret about like how to you know how to become a pro wrestler and Brett kind of blows him off on the air. And then I think as the story goes, Brett maybe found him after the show and, you know, tried to give him more, more specific advice or whatever, but they, you know, they show that and they go all the way through his career, you know, his stuff with Christian all the way through to uh, the, the comeback and, and present day and all that. So they give him that great video package. And then he goes out and he has a, just an amazing crowd in Toronto um, and then he has a, a good match. He had a good match with Sheamus and he won in his hometown. So I guess I just, unless it's driven entirely by spite, <laughs> how's it getting better than that? <laughs> than you getting this nice send off and wrestling in your hometown and having a good match you know, he talked after the match specifically about how much Sheamus means to him as a friend and that they'd never, you know, they'd never had a one-on-one match before. So he wanted Sheamus to be his last, you know, his last opponent of this run. It's like, I don't, I don't know what else, <laughs> what else do you want out of pro wrestling? Unless you're just spiteful, <laughs> which if you are, you know, by all means go, go do your thing, man. But uh, may yeah. I, may I raise the possibility that, Besides spite, which is always a possibility, particularly Especially involving if, Triple H and yes, Edge. particularly if you have 
spent most of your career trying to stay out of the creative plans of, of Paul Levesque. <laughs> and now he's the chief content officer of the company that you're working for. Uh, may I proffer that somewhere in the neighborhood of $5 million <laughs> yeah. would be, would be another possible reason. Just ballparking say AEW offers him a two year deal worth two and a half million a year or whatever the number is, or a three year deal worth 2 million a year or whatever the number is. Right. I think that's probably another reason millions of dollars <laughs> besides spite. You're, like you're right. Absolutely. You're right. That could very well be it. It's just one of the things where like, once you, once you have $10 million or more, what is what is another five? I guess maybe it's security. Um, I th- I think we think of things differently though, because you and I have both said like, okay, if I got three million dollars, I would move to Hawaii and no one would ever see me again. My family would never see me again. I would Skype in for holidays, maybe. Mm-hmm. Other than that, no one who knows me would ever see me again. Major League Baseball players when they become free agents, always sign for the highest dollar figure offered. True. <laughs> and it's like they, they have tens of millions of dollars. What's the difference between $200 million and $250 million? Well, apparently a lot because they <laughs> always take the highest dollar figure. True. It's like it, it just always works that way. I don't know. Yeah. No, I think you're right, though. And, you know, on the creative side of things, uh, you know, I, I mostly hated everything he did on this <laughs> this comeback run. Um, some of the Orton stuff at the start I thought was good. And then they had the worst match of all time at that WrestleMania, um, the, COVID, like, the COVID WrestleMania. And like the first time you saw him do an acting promo, it was kind of cool. Maybe the first couple of times you saw mm-hmm. him do one of his Adam is an actor now promos. It was cool. Sure. And then he did it. And then he did it for two and a half more years. Yeah. It uh, got a little long in the tooth to say the least, but uh, obviously on the other side, a lot of his old, uh, his old running buddies are in AEW currently. Um, you got, if you want to reunite him and Christian and do the, do the generational tag team thing with them and FTR. Obviously, he's very tight with those guys. I am, and you know, uh, Mr. Dickhead famously before his podcast got canceled, yes. uh, uh, you know, said that hey, you know, it's not it's not as crazy as you might think that Edge could end up here one day or something like that. So uh, I'm sure that would be enticing. And obviously, there's other teams like the Bucks that I'm sure he would want to work with too. And the Hardys are there and. You do a, you know, you could do another ladder match for old time's sake or whatever and whatever. Like you, nothing, <laughs> Edge going to either company, coming back to WWE or going to AEW, neither of them really excites me as an idea because I didn't really care for his acting promos after a while, as you said. And also, I didn't really think he had it in the ring either, um, or at least he didn't evolve enough. Um, and also insisted on going out there. Another thing he and Paul have in common insisted on going out there for seemingly like 38 minutes every time. Um, So nothing about uh, Adam Copeland coming back to wrestling would excite me, but there's maybe more meat on the bone, I guess, creatively of him going to a new company filled with people he either hasn't worked with in a long time or has never worked with as opposed to just, coming back and being a guy on on raw or smackdown for another year so you know we'll see but hey you know you always there's always those saudi show payouts to think about too so Mm. if we're we're worried about money don't Mm. don't uh don't forget about those adam yeah yeah bit and bill's not around to get those bill and uh mark aren't around to get those paydays anymore that's right so. it's it's uh, it's the ruthless aggression era batista and edge's phone's gonna start ringing pretty soon mm. dear lord dave dave batista thankfully i think is too rich to uh to answer the phone <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean allegedly that's he wanted that wrestlemania match with paul he got it and no one has ever seen him again <laughs> yeah wwe 
Man, I respect that guy. Yep. All right. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what's going on in WWE, AEW all in this Sunday afternoon, a terrible day in time for pay-per-view. <laughs> I mean, as someone who goes to bed at a normal time and has work the next day, I like the idea that it's not, <laughs> uh, you know, not going to run until midnight Sunday night, but. <laughs> okay. The show is the pre-show, which has uh, two two title matches on it. It's going to start at noon Eastern time. The main show is going to go until at least 5 p.m. Eastern time. Then there's going to be a half hour of downtime. Then Tony Khan and his (laughs) merry band of pranksters are going to speak for 90 minutes to the media. This is going to be wrestling, Tony Khan wrestling from noon till 7 p.m. that day. It's God awful. Anyway, well, not always the chance do. someone could have a meltdown at the presser. Hey, all those various factions in that locker room are going to be under one roof. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you add in, you know, a jet lag of 20 hours or whatever the flight is to get over there. Yeah, it's tremendous. All right. Well, let's preview the show real quick. Wembley Stadium, over 80,000 people expected to be there. Conflicting, uh, Okay, here's the problem with uh, um, they're not a public company. They don't have to release their financials or their uh, their ticket information. They have a lot of incentive to lie about how many people are in the building. The closest thing we have to an independent audit of eight, of any wrestling attendance number is this Twitter account called WrestleTix. God bless them. Mm-hmm. They're trying to do everything that uh, they're they're doing the Lord's work over there. However, the, their their methodology is counting dots on uh, counting pink and gray dots on Ticketmaster ticket maps, which may not be the most accurate way of going about this, and doesn't include things like comp tickets and all that. So. We don't really know. We don't really know how many people are at WrestleMania 32. We don't really know how many people are going to be at Wembley. We don't really know how many people were at WrestleMania this year. It's, <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure what they've done is impressive as hell. Selling all these tickets, selling somewhere in the neighborhood of 80,000 tickets to a show is tremendous. Good for them. We're doing quite well, thank you. Yes, exactly. Thank you for remembering that joke. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, the pre-show. Um, Aussie Open defending the ROH, the prestigious Ring of Honor World Tag Team titles against MJF and Adam Cole. I don't know what you do here. I assume that this is uh, setting up... This is basically an angle for their main event match on the main show four hours later i just don't i assume they have to win the titles yeah that's kind of what i thought i when they announced this i i took that to mean and maybe this is foolish of me to (laughs) try to uh try to assume but i took it to mean that perhaps this is this is going beyond them as a team is going beyond this show and the next weekend's show right um and so they're going to have a little run as tag team champions and probably maybe you set up uh, eventually you do a tag title match with the kingdom and Roddy in their corner against them. And then you do whoever's turning, you do the horseman beat down of the other guy in that match. And then the kingdom win the ROH tag titles and take them back off the show while, you know, the two real stars feud on, on AEW television. Sure. You got uh, you got the kingdom floating around here. You got Roddy the Friendship Cuck floating around here. <laughs> and Best we got character Ky- in <laughs> AEW, Roderick Strong, angry cuck. You put you pointed out last week that they've now turned Roddy into pure comedy, and it's worth debating whether that was the plan all along, or they just realized how terrible he was coming off and decided this has to be comedy. I'd like to think it's the second one and that it was Roddy (laughs) 
Roddy himself was like, oh no, I have to be a goofball here because otherwise my career is over. <laughs> yes. It's been about a year now, by the way. What, 14 months maybe since Kyle O'Reilly had neck surgery? 13, mm-hmm. 14 months? Mm-hmm. So just timetable wise, it would make sense if he were to pop up around here soon. And then you would have uh, O'Reilly, Cole, MJF on one side and Roddy and the kingdom on the other. Or you can mix and match those six guys, whichever way you choose. Right. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah, I I just I I took this to mean uh, in the short term, MJF and Cole are winning those belts. And this is a and this angle is not they're not doing the turn here, even though I think most people expect them to. Yeah. Uh, Jack Perry will defend the FTW championship against Hook on the pre-show. Funny for a number of reasons. One, they announced I'm not sure whether it was last week's Dynamite or last week's collision, but they announced that Jack Perry, bad boy, rebel would be retiring (laughs) the FTW championship on this week's Dynamite. He's had enough of it. He's burying the legacy of ECW and the FTW championship, which AEW does not recognize, but constantly has title matches for. And uh, that he would be retiring that title on this week's Dynamite. Then during Dynamite, they run a promo saying, uh, Jack Perry will be retiring the FTW title on this week's Collision. So pretty clearly uh, they ran out of time on Dynamite and it got bumped to Saturday. So then on Thursday, the AEW Unrestricted podcast came out and the right hand forgot to tell the left hand what they were doing. And Tony Khan went on there and scooped his own show, uh, obviously in an interview that was taped a week or weeks ago and announced Jack Perry defending the FTW title against Hook, the returning Hook. Um, on the uh, zero hour pre show for all in, uh, so a wonderful continuity error and a uh, just classic AEW angle here with uh, Jack Perry, who we've not seen in weeks, uh, defending the FTW title against the returning hook on the pre show. Yeah, I mean, for all the TV time this got, and I know I think there's like a hard out for the show because of when the 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 public transportation shuts down at night in England or London, but man, for all the weeks of television they put into Jack Perry versus hook did not even make this onto the main show is like, well, that seems like a little bit of a waste of time. Doesn't it? Why don't you just, they have, they literally have another pay-per-view seven days later. Why don't you just do it there? (laughs) I don't know. I guess, I don't know. Is being on the pre-show of the 80,000 seat. I mean, I think that's, being on the pre-show of the 80,000 fan show is more is probably higher higher level for a performer than being in on the 8,000 right. uh, fan Chicago show main show but yes in right. a, in in a different era where the payoffs would be different then it would it would probably matter sure yeah that's a good point uh main card FTR defending the world tag team titles against the young bucks um ftr hair got himself into a bit of hot water (laughs) last week didn't if you would ask me to predict which of the two ftr members bald or hair would have gotten in trouble i would have not picked hair but uh hair was the one who was arrested and arraigned and released on bail and um is alleged to have waved a handgun at a motor at a fellow motorist Ooh. in Florida. Just great story there. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, those guys will be defending their titles against the Young Bucks. And they did a sit down promo on this week's Dynamite for it. Every time the Young Bucks speak, they turn themselves heel. I'm not sure if they're aware of this or not. Um, I know that it's kind of their th- thing, their shtick. But um, I find them absolutely repulsive every time they speak. (laughs) But anyway, these two tag teams are excellent wrestling tag teams and should have an excellent wrestling match. Yeah, I think it'll be great. I I didn't have quite the averse reaction 
to their to their sit down promo because I do think you needed even though I don't think any of these four men are particularly gifted speakers, I think you needed to do something <laughs> to try to sell the match uh, a oh, little bit. <laughs> pretty pretty much all they had done prior to that segment was put four of them in the ring together and have them look at each other. <laughs> Correct. So in that case, it was good. I don't like this. is, And this is a thing that doesn't just happen in AEW. It doesn't just happen in Young Bucks matches. I don't like when the challenger for uh, when the challengers for the belts say we don't have to win or we don't care if we win. <laughs> well, why are you doing it then? Why should I care? <laughs> exactly. Um, so like, I think you can make it part of it. Be like, Hey, we want to win because we want those belts and it'll add to our legacy, even though our legacy is already much bigger than any other tag team of this era. And that's and they can still turn it and say, hey, and that's why beating us, even though you're the champions, it's still, you know, a, this is still the biggest match of your careers, even though you're already the champions. Like you could still say what they said. It just maybe maybe say something about why you want to win the belts and why yeah. that matters before you do the bit about how, you know, you're the you're the biggest tag team of your generation already and nobody else's legacy compares to yours. So, hey, look at you, better at promos than the young bucks. <laughs> well, again, it's not a high bar. <laughs> look you got, at you. When you got Cash Wheeler and and Nick Jackson, uh, but uh, yeah, it's it could have been it could have been better, but hey, at least they did something. Uh, they chose not to uh, well, we can get to this when we get to that match. But uh, other members of the elite did not cut a promo on the go home show. So at least they did something to try to sell you on this match, I guess. If we're if we're putting the bar just on the floor, sure. Um, women's title four way: Sheeta defending against uh, Soraya, Britt Baker, and Tony Storm. Tony Storm has this new Hollywood starlet from the fifties, Kristen Wiig character that everyone seems to love. I saw the uh, Snowboy account on Twitter say that uh, Tony Storm uh, looks like she's at the funeral for her husband, who she killed. <laughs> and that's that's pretty perfect. That's a that's pretty awesome. perfect yeah. It's a pretty perfect description of what Tony Storm is doing right now. Um, it seems like she uh, should probably break away from the outcasts and is doing a, something different than what the other outcasts are doing. Um, a lot of ways you can go here. She had just won the title. It would be rude to take it off of her, but uh, they're <laughs> rude. <laughs> this is the wrestling business. Uh, Tony Storm is from uh, New Zealand, Australia, um, uh, uh, Liverpool, and uh, Orlando now. She has four hometowns. But this <laughs> so uh, she's from the United Kingdom as well. This is one of her many hometowns. She could win it. Soraya obvious is making a lot of money. And uh, to justify that contract, you would think that she would have to be pushed higher than on the card than she has been so far in her AEW run, whether she mm -hmm. deserves it or not. And then Britt Baker is the homegrown. She was on the original all in in the in the women's match on the original all in and uh, probably should be the champion of this division all the time, given how much TV time <laughs> is is spent on her. Um, so you can make a case for all four women winning here. Do you have a sense of which way they're going to go? Um, yeah, I mean, I I could see Soraya winning it. Like you said, they pay a lot of money and it's her home country as well, obviously. So it's, uh, you know, it makes for a good a good story, even though she's a heel um, <laughs> of her, you know, going from never wrestling again to winning the title and the biggest, you know, or one of the highest paid attendance shows of all time. Um, so you could do that. Um, Cheetah also has the, the built in poetry of the last time she was champion. She wrestled in front of no fans. She wrestled in front of Billy Gunn's dickhead sons and sunny kiss and whoever else was sitting at the, at ringside during, uh, yep. during the pandemic. And now she's going to defend the title in front of, all these people, so uh, pineapple Pete. That's right. Remember that guy. What Ugh. happened to that guy? <laughs> Ugh. <laughs> See, he ended up doing a job, doing jobs on NXT. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. 
first uh, first guy to defect from AEW to NXT. That's a, that's a fun uh, wrestling trivia uh, uh, nugget for you. But yeah, first first guy in history AEW wouldn't sign. <laughs> <laughs> what does that tell you? <laughs> Oof. Yeah, I mean, I he had a, like a seventy second match with Jericho. <laughs> Yeah, I do remember that during the uh, during the COVID era. But anyway, yeah. uh, she, she <laughs> I digress. Uh, Sheeta Sheeta winning or retaining the title in front of all these people after never defending her title in front of people. Well, actually, she defended it against somebody like two weeks ago, so they kind of ruined that. But hey, uh, it's still a giant swath of people. Um, so uh, yeah, I would say Sheeta or Soraya are like the safe bets. But yeah, as you mentioned it. Uh, Britt doesn't really win a lot of matches, but she's still the most pushed character <laughs> yes. on the division and has been since the company's inception. Yes. So uh, that's, yeah, I, you can make a case for any of these, and I don't really think it matters all that much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a, that, that is one plus. It's just the AEW Women's World title. Right. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> right. Exactly. This is a, Man, women's wrestling has not meant less <laughs> in like the time we've been doing this podcast than it does right now in both major companies. Triple H and Tony Khan booking the two biggest women's divisions in the world is bad for <laughs> is bad. Sean, Sean does a nice job with the ladies on NXT. Yes, they do a wonderful variety show. <laughs> <laughs> they're integrated into the product in a way that feels organic mm-hmm. and like you're not for the you're not stopwatch watching for all the people that are <laughs> somehow uh, have made that a negative <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like okay well it doesn't feel like you're trying to hit a quota when you have like four women's matches and four men's matches on an NXT episode because these characters are more fully developed and it Anyway, regardless, <laughs> Shawn Michaels is the best women's wrestling booker going currently. Feminist icon, Shawn Michaels. <laughs> it's unreal. <laughs> it's absolutely unreal. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Um, trio's title, House of Black, defending against uh, Badass Billy Gunn and The Acclaimed. They, uh, the House of Black stole Billy's boots and uh, and threw them in a trash compactor and now he's back for revenge yeah um i was excited to learn uh on dynamite this week that i thought daddy ass was just like regular billy gun with a nickname but right. it's a it was a it's like it's like mankind it's like a different it's it's his dude love i guess it's a different persona cool he, sh- he shed that skin and now he's the badass billy gun you know from 1999 <laughs> yeah that's cool so he could, he still has Mr. Ass he could go into. He still has the one he could go mm-hmm. into. He still has the smoking gun yep. persona he could get into. Cute Kip, um, where he was like a hair designer in TNA or something. Yep, cute Kip. Oh, man. We have so much Billy Gun lore <laughs> still to explore. I don't know. People will go crazy for the acclaim. They deserve to be on this show. Like, they they should be on this show. They should be in every opening match on every pay-per-view until they run out of steam. Yeah. Like the New Age Outlaws. Like, that could be a five-year run if you do it right. Yep. Like the New Age Outlaws, like Enzo and Cass should have been. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, oh. This is not a brain surgery. Why does everyone make this so difficult? <laughs> seriously why is it so difficult like i know there are moving parts and egos and people fighting and yelling at each other and 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 getting arrested and things that caught the throw wrenches and getting injured at the throw wrenches in your in your creative plans but why is it so hard <laughs> honestly if you make yourself a spreadsheet <laughs> i have several spreadsheets that i could <laughs> send around yeah Send, send Tony a few <laughs> templates. Oh, please do not try to use any spreadsheets if you play WWE 2K, by the way. <laughs> I I tried to employ a spreadsheet <laughs> this year for WWE 2K23 because uh-huh. I I um I played 2K22 uh, quite a bit. 
And mm-hmm. I was like, you know what might this what might make this more fun is if it were like I was actually booking. Mm-hmm. So let me make myself some spreadsheets. We'll keep track of wins and losses. We'll keep track of the week. The t- anyway, long story short, I gave myself a a, a full time job um, <laughs> trying to keep track of my WWE 2K universe. And I don't recommend using spreadsheets to play video games. It's just <laughs> it takes away from the fun. Oh wow. <laughs> I thought it would enhance the fun. It that did not happen. <laughs> My favorite part is that I jokingly said to you at some <laughs> point when you were like, "Well, I've got to, you know, I've got to download all this, all these, uh, you know, all these yeah. creative characters. I got to do all this right. stuff. Like, you know, there's a lot of moving parts." And I was like, right. "Perhaps you could create a spreadsheet <laughs> to make sure you're having the maximum amount of fun while right. you're playing this video game." And then you yes. did it, <laughs> and yes. I think that's wonderful. <laughs> Not being ironic, I think it's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Well, I try, you know? It's like, now I know. You tried now to I crack know. it. <laughs> right. All right. Uh, coffin match on this uh, all-in show. Darby Allen and Sting against Swerve Strickland and Kristen Kate. Christian Kate. Kristen Cage. I hope that's not anyone's name. Uh, Darby and Sting versus Swerve and Christian who uh, managed to get in a crack at Nick Wayne's dead father this week on Dynamite. They retconned the whole AR Fox turning on Darby angle and joining Swerve and the mogul embassy and took him out of the match. I don't know that it's because he can't get into the UK. I'm not sure what his status is, but just struck me as, you know, seems probably kind of likely that maybe if they take a guy out of a a pay-per-view match the week before they found out maybe that he can't get into the UK. I don't know. But uh, that coffin match is now Darby and Sting against Swerve and Christian. Yeah, it seems pretty sudden, too, because they shot an angle like on cell phone video of Darby and Sting going to AR Fox's school and beating him up in front of like 20 people. (laughs) Yeah, they sure Um, did. So something changed pretty drastically in the last few days, I guess. Uh and uh, or maybe they thought they could get whatever it was resolved and just, hey, gun to their head, t- clock was ticking, had to make the call. But yeah, I mean, feel bad for AR Fox missing out on getting the rest of Sting in front of 8,000 people. Yeah. Probably not too many more times someone's going to get that opportunity. But yeah. it does correct a problem, which I have noticed. I don't think we've talked about it on the show, which is that Darby has like two different feuds that weren't crossing over at all. True. Where he's feuding with Swerve and Swerve's guys on Dynamite, and he's Nick Wayne's mentor, and Sting is his mentor. He's the dad. Nick Wayne is the son, and Sting is the granddad. Yes. Um, and then on Collision, he's wrestling the Luchasaur, or he's you know he's trying to wrestle the TNT Championship away from Christian and the Luchasaurus to restore the prestige and honor of that belt that it apparently had at some point. Yes. Um, so those feuds really didn't intermingle at all for several weeks. And then in the on the final dynamite before uh, before the pay-per-view, they're like, oh, yeah, he's feuding with two guys. Just put the other guys feuding with in there. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure there'll still be a lot of run ins, a lot of chances for we'll, I'm sure we'll get we'll get Prince Dana and uh, and Brian Cage on this show. Don't you worry. Protagonist of AEW and Ring of Honor, Brian Cage. Yes. Um, Stadium Stampede. They did another. They did an angle to take Ray Phoenix out of that match this uh, this week. Apparently for some kind of visa issue mm-hmm. as well. He couldn't get into the UK, and so uh, but they brought Santana, Santana and Ortiz back. They have reunited apparently, even though they didn't look at each other or make eye contact once on television. Mm -hmm. And they they are teaming with Blackpool (laughs) Combat Club and facing Eddie Kingston, Orange Cassidy, the best friends, and Penta Alzara Mieto. Stadium Stampede. People seem to like those matches. I'm not among them, but uh, people seem to like these matches. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I mean, those matches are so chaotic and weird in a, uh, you know, in the arenas with 10,000 people so trying to do those in a stadium with 80,000 is going to be an interesting logistical challenge I would have to imagine Uh, I I would assume they'll block 
I don't know. You don't want to block off too many uh, areas on the floor where you could put people and sell tickets. Right. But also, you don't want to have a stadium full of 80,000 people and, like, be shooting stuff in the back, you know? So, I don't exactly. know. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that. Uh, the Golden Elite, Ibushi, Omega, Hangman, uh, facing Takeshita and uh, your friend Juice and Jay White. Uh Random trios match on this show with uh, Kenny, Hangman, and Ibushi against Takeshita and the Bullet Club boys. Uh, yeah, this is it'll be a good match. It'll be a really good match. Juice is going to do some funny stuff, and there will be good wrestling here. Um, I wonder long term what I don't know how much Ibushi's going to be in. <laughs> Uh, Bucks are back as a tag. Uh, feels like maybe now you gotta split Hangman and Kenny off and let them do single stuff. Um, but I don't, I don't know. Uh, for for right now, it's just it's a six man to get as many people on the show. That's what it feels like. It's gotta yes. do something with Hangman and Kenny. Uh, and we're just doing that. Uh, it feels like this should be a bigger deal because it's. You know, Kenny and Takeshita had been building for months and months and months and intertwined with the other elite feuds and all that. And then finally they're going to meet in this six man and Takeshita feels like the third guy on that team. So I feel like they've dropped dropped the ball with him, especially considering the heat that he and Callis were getting as a duo uh, ever since Callis's uh, focus has been split, as we can talk about in a moment here. Sure. Will Osprey with Don Callis as his manager facing Chris Jericho at all in. Um, Osprey and Jericho did a contract signing on Dynamite this week, which I thought was the best thing on the show by leaps and bounds. Mm. And uh, I thought Chris Jericho, hold your breath, was very good in this segment. <laughs> I thought I thought Will Osprey, except for the detour he took during his promo to talk about how he's going to be a free agent in six months and he's going to make millions of dollars. Um, I thought Will Ospreay spoke well for the most part. And um, if it were building up any other match, maybe I think that was a really effective segment, but I think everyone wants to see Will Ospreay more than I do. And literally everyone wants to see Chris Jericho <laughs> more than I do. So uh, I don't, I don't care about this match. No, it's just like, yeah, if, if you're going to match Osprey against an AEW guy, uh, Jericho's pretty low on my list uh, yeah. at the, at this point. There's about a million guys I'd rather see Osprey wrestle than him. But yes, it was a good promo. Uh, they're trying, again, it feels like this kind of disjointed thing because Osprey's also feuding with Kenny and now he's feuding with Jericho. Again, you have a million other shows. You can you can you can mix all of this together if you want. But um, yeah, Jericho and Osprey uh, just doesn't doesn't feel like uh, a big hot match. But obviously, again, Osprey's the hometown boy. Jericho, they already announced Fozzy is going to perform live uh, at <laughs> Wembley Stadium. Oh man, Jericho's going to sing himself to the ring. Um, boy, what a treat! What a How, wonderful treat for the fans uh, performing their life. I know they've had the Fozzy guitar guy out there a time or two. Have they had the full Fozzy before? I don't I, remember. I don't think so. They did like a he did like a choir entrance for himself at one point. I remember that, but I don't I don't remember like oh, Fozzy boy. playing live. Oh, it's wonderful. Oh, that's tremendous. CM Punk uh, defending the quote unquote real world championship against Samoa Joe. I hope these guys don't try any go to sleeps <laughs> or like they use the ropes to help. Um, I don't know. Great talkers, two very old men wrestling one another. I was going to say to Joe's credit, he got up on punk shoulders for that go to sleep on collision last week. Real easy. It was yeah. the part where punk had to like lift him off the shoulders and, and, and knee him in the face that, <laughs> when the problems arose <laughs> yeah um so yeah maybe maybe you uh, you do some submissions you do some chops you know and you do some submissions and uh you you don't you don't have to 
you don't got to do that, you know? <laughs> Joe needs to jump off the middle rope into a go to sleep. Yes, that's, exactly. <laughs> that's the finish. That's the finish. We'll see if they do it. And then uh, MJF and Adam Cole for the AW World title. We presume this is going on last. We don't know. It's a chance Stadium Stampede could go on last. We don't know. MJF and Cole, whatever it is, it feels like it's the next step in the storyline, not the final destination. So we'll have to see what they do. Yeah, I think I don't know anymore because I don't feel like there's a lot of connective tissue between the AEW of a couple of years ago and the <laughs> AEW of now. Yeah, A couple of years ago, I think this show has a big happy ending, whatever that may be. Whether that's, you know, MJF and, and Cole have a total baby face match and then they shake hands and hug at the end and run off a pair of heels or whatever. Like you would get a big happy ending to end this show. Um, so I don't know that that's the case in <laughs> in 2023 AEW. Uh, so, yeah, I don't I don't know. Like I said, I still don't think this is the end or even the time that the big turn happens for Cole and MJF at the show. So I guess you kind of have to do that. But then it's just like, are people going to be people? I feel like people will be waiting for the turn. And then if they don't get it, then they'll be staring at the aisle waiting for somebody to run in or whatever to set up the next twist. So we'll see. All right. Well, I don't think we talked about uh, Okada and the Naito and the G1. I don't remember when we last recorded, but uh, that's a match that happened. Having Tetsuya Naito win the G1 mm -hmm. here in uh, 2023 is certainly a choice. And uh, he looked good um, in this tournament in the biggest matches. Um, yeah. And <laughs> this seems to, this is his gold watch. Mm -hmm. uh, he gets one more Tokyo Dome main event and good for him. And I assume we're getting Okada and Danielson on that on uh, January 4th. And I assume we're getting uh, Omega and Osprey three. I have no idea why they wouldn't do that at Wembley unless they were asked not to because the plan is to do it in Tokyo. And so that's just I assume that those were three big matches on the, on uh, on that show next year. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And yeah, my only my only other thought is that you watch that the the semifinals against Osprey and then that main event against Okada. Osprey, I mean, Naito's still good, but yeah. it's like the crowd was just molten for him. Yes. Like they just came alive for him in a way I have not heard a post-COVID New Japan crowd come alive for him. So whether they should be <laughs> perhaps looking to the future that's a different discussion but if the question is is he over enough to main event another tokyo dome boy it sure feels like it at the moment at least all right anything else yeah i think that about wraps it up all right until next time everyone i'm ethan and i'm Ian. we will be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life terry funk rules bitch Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. Skylar Gray was born to sing um, the hook on hip-hop uh pop song mashups that were very popular about 12 years ago. <laughs> Fortunately, I don't think it's a genre that really exists anymore. No, it's like it really now it only she only exists for when LeBron James resigns with <laughs> Cleveland every four years. Yes, right. You just got to hope for more, uh, you know, all time all-time athlete returning to his original team and that's yeah. that's her window yeah i try to keep on keeping on